and welcome everyone. We have made it to week three of Nature Science and we are so pleased you are here. I didn't get a chance to ask if anybody is here for the first time, but my guess is that there might be some first timers. And uh, as I always say, you are in for a treat. We have a lot of fun during these, these 30 minutes which just fly by. So typically, um, this is the point in time when I give you a spoiler alert if Holly's gonna do anything to really shake us up. But I don't really feel like the live rat's enough for today. <laughs> That's right, I think that is enough for us. So um, I always like to give everybody a few minutes to gather the materials that we're going to use at the end of today's session. And so uh, Holly will be reading a story and sometimes uh, the grown-ups may have time to gather materials then. So just wanted you to take a quick look at that. And uh, for the newbies, uh, we like to just kind of put these questions out front. So I know that it's on a lot of people's minds. You will receive a certificate for attending all four of these sessions. It is a series. So either if you attended in person or if you were able to watch the recordings, we will send certificates when it's completed after next week. And the recording is available. And in our chat room, we have Terry and Marilyn on hand from our team here at Becker's that will be, um, they'll put a link that you can access the recordings and also the printed copy of all the activities we've been doing. And finally, uh, after, Holly does her presentation today. We'll talk about how you can purchase the books that Holly shares with you each week. Any questions about any of these things, please put them in the chat room. Oh, someone asked and, what the rat's name was. This is Flo. Okay. Oh, thank you, Flo. Flo. Flo, and, and we also met Dottie. Yes, we met Dottie a little bit earlier. So this is always one of my favorite slides when I get to <laughs> reintroduce Holly and we try to keep it interesting because of those of you who have been with us every week, um, you think you know Holly, but there's, <laughs> there's just so much depth to this woman. So um, <laughs> last week we learned that one of her favorite food groups was fruit. Mm -hmm. And we obviously know by now she absolutely loves worms, uh, worms, rats, you know, it's kind of a close, Close comparison there, I'm not sure who wins out. And, um, oh, we also learned she's very excitable and just like her, her just her, her as her friendly rats are yep. today. Very excitable. So um, what we're gonna learn more about Holly today, we're gonna learn about one of her favorite animals will be revealed in this session. And um, we're also going to find out some sneaky things she does to watch animals. And finally, I wanted to um, give a shout out to her two very cool kids who are pictured here. And uh, Holly has been so kind to share some beautiful pictures of them doing the activities that we participate in. So, right, in quarantine, um, they were the only kids around, so they didn't, yeah. have, a <laughs> they didn't so, have a choice. So please <laughs> let them know that we gave them a big thank you for help, helping us out. So if everybody's ready, I think we're going to get started. I think Flo's ready. Here she goes, okay. she's ready. Oh, she grabbed onto the computer. She's more than ready. See okay. you guys after. First, see you after. Hi everyone, welcome back to Nature Science with Holly for Becker School Supplies. So today we're talking about one of my favorite topics. We're talking about animals. I love animals. Do you love animals? Do you know a lot about them? So cool. All right, I want you to close your eyes and think about your favorite animal. What does your animal look like? What is it doing? Is it climbing? Is it flying? Is it swimming? Does it look furry or smooth or squishy? Is it big or small? Open your eyes. There are so many different kinds of animals out there and they all have neat things on their bodies to help them to be happy, healthy, successful animals. So they have things on their body that help them to find food and they have things that help to keep them safe and to take care of their babies. Animals have awesome, awesome things on their body to help them to uh, survive. Okay, here's our story. It's called, What Do You Do With a Tail Like This? by Steve Jenkins and Robin Page. What do you notice about this cover? 
Yeah, it's got a tail on it, but we can't see what animal it belongs to. So we have to make some observations. What are some things you notice about this tail? Is it long or short? What color is it? Does it stick out straight or does it curve? Is it look, does it look furry or does it look smooth? Hmm, I guess we're gonna have to read to figure out what animal this belongs to. What do you do with a tail like this? Animals use their noses, ears, tails, eyes, mouths, and feet in very different ways. See if you can guess which animal each part belongs to and how it is used. At the back of the book, you can find out more about these animals. So this book is like a game. We're going to have to use our powers of observation and make guesses about what animals we're looking at. So cool. Grown-ups, this book is not only fun to read, but the information at the back is great. It gives you lots of cool information about some neat animals. What do you do with a nose like this? We see all different kinds of noses. What observations can you make? Hmm, some of the noses are long and some are short. Some are flat and some have crazy things sticking out the side. Do you think you know what animals these noses belong to? Let's find out. If you're a platypus, you use your nose to dig in the mud. <gasps> do you use your nose to dig in the mud? I hope not. What part of your body do you use to dig? Yeah, you probably use these and maybe a shovel. If you're a hyena, you find your next meal with your nose. What do they mean by that? How do you find a meal with your nose? Yeah, they can smell it. They've got an awesome sense of smell. And they can use that sense of smell to find animals that they're trying to eat. If you're an elephant, did you know that nose was an elephant nose? You use your nose to give yourself a bath. So elephants can suck up water with their trunk and then spray it down their back in those hard to reach places. Really cool. Can you do that? I do not suggest you try. Your grown up will not be happy if you tried that at bath time. If you're an alligator, you breathe through your nose while hiding under the water. That's so neat. How does that happen? How can an alligator be under the water but still use its nose to breathe? It's because of where its nose is. So its nostrils are on the top of its snout so that while it's underwater, it can still breathe and have its eyes out so it can hunt while staying hidden under the water. And then if you're a mole, you use your nose to find your way underground. So the star-nosed mole has all of these little sort of sticky outy bits. And a mole will use its nose to smell, but will also use its nose to feel. So each of those little sticky outy bits act kind of like fingers to help the mole feel around while it's underground. Pretty neat. What do you do with ears like these? What do you notice about these ears? You may have noticed some are big and some are small and some don't look like ears at all. Do you think you know what animals these belong to? Let's find out. So those big ears right in the middle, if you're a jackrabbit, you use your ears to keep cool. So where jackrabbits live, it gets really, really hot during the day. So uh, when they need to cool off, they actually release a lot of heat to those really long ears. So it helps keep them cool. If you're a bat, those are those little ears in the corner, you see with your ears. Hmm. What part of our body do we use to see? Yeah, we use our eyes to see. Well, so do bats. Bats can see with their eyes too. They're not blind. They can see with their eyes, but they're also able to use their ears to figure out where they're going. Pretty cool. So they make lots of little noises, chirps and squeaks. And those chirps and squeaks go out in front of them. And then they bounce off of things that might be uh, in the bat's path. So they can hear the echo and figure out if there are different things in front of them so they can fly around them. Pretty neat. If you're a hippopotamus, you close your ears when you're underwater. That would be very handy. If you're a cricket, you hear with ears that are on your knees. Whoa. So our bat, our jackrabbit, and our hippopotamus, they all had sort of these sticky out ears like we do, okay? And they're on their heads, just like our heads. 
but crickets actually are able to pick up sounds, this little area on their front legs there. And that's how they figure out different sounds and different vibrations in the world around them. And if you're a humpback whale, you hear sounds hundreds of miles away. Whales have awesome hearing, but can you see their ears? No, they're not sticking out like all the other animals' ears are. So they're able to hear really well, even though they don't have these big sticky out of ears like we have or the jackrabbit or the bat has. Awesome stuff. What do you do with a tail like this? I see so many cool tails. And I think I see the tail of one of my favorite animals on this page. Which one do you think is my favorite animal? Do you know what animals these belong to? Let's find out. If you're a giraffe, you brush off pesky flies with your tail. It's like having a built-in fly swatter. That way they can keep the flies away from them and so the flies don't bite them. If you're a skunk, you lift your tail to warn that a stinky spray is on the way. Did you guess that a skunk was one of my favorite animals? I love skunks. They're so cool. But you're right. They can be very, very stinky. And that spray is a great way of keeping themselves safe. But you know what? They'll do lots of other things before they even spray. And that's where their tail comes in. They'll lift their tail up and they'll spread out the hairs on it to make themselves look really big and scary. It's not big and scary. It's pretty adorable, honestly. But they're hoping that they're big and scary and they can scare away animals who want to try to eat them. And then they'll do what the skunk's doing on this page. They'll do a handstand. So cool. I can't even do a handstand. But skunks do it to scare away animals and to warn them that a stinky spray might be coming. So cool. Oh, and there's our lizard from the front page. If you're a lizard, you break off your tail to get away. Now, not all lizards can do this, but some lizards can. They have points along their tail that can easily break. And so the tail goes wiggling in one direction and the lizard runs as fast as it can in the other. And hopefully the predator will chase the tail and not the lizard. Now, if the lizard's healthy and has plenty of food and plenty of water, that tail will actually grow back. So amazing. If you're a scorpion, your tail can give a nasty sting. Now that sting is really important because they sting their food before they eat it. It's their way of hunting. If you're a monkey, you hang from a tree by your tail. Monkey tails are amazing. It's like having an extra hand to help them to climb and to swing. What do you do with eyes like these? Whoa. What are some observations you can make about those eyes? Some are really big and some are really small. And then what's going on with this eyeball down here? Hmm, let's find out. If you're an eagle, did you know that was an eagle? If you're an eagle, you spot tiny animals from high in the air. Such good eyesight. If you're a chameleon, you look two ways at once. Can we do that? Nope. Our eyes go the same direction. We can look around with our eyes, but both eyes sort of go the same way. And they're sort of stuck in our head. With a chameleon, their eyes can actually move like this. They can see in two different directions at once, which is really important if you don't want to get eaten by a predator. So it helps them to stay safe by looking all around them at all times. If you're a four-eyed fish, you look above and below the water at the same time. Now, here's a secret about four-eyed fish. They don't have four eyes. <laughs> they only have two eyes, but their eyes are sort of split so that when they're at the surface of the water, they can use the top part of their eyes to look up, and they can use the bottom part of their eyes to look down into the water. Neato. If you're a horned lizard, you squirt blood out of your eyes. Why? Why do you think a horned lizard will want to squirt blood out of their eyes? It's to startle away predators. Now, like our skunk, they'll do lots of other things first. They'll puff up and they'll try to stay really still and they'll do all those different things. But if that doesn't work, they can squirt blood, a little bit of blood out of their eyes. And that's startling. If you went to eat something and it started squirting everywhere, you'd probably be like, whoa, 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 maybe I don't want to eat this thing anymore. And that's what the horned lizard, lizard is hoping, that its predators are so startled that they don't want to eat it anymore.
If you're a bush baby, you use your large eyes to see clearly at night. So lots of nocturnal animals. Do you know what nocturnal means? Yeah, animals that come out at night have very, very large eyes. And those large eyes are important because their eyes still need light to see. They just need a lot less because they've got these big eyes collecting all the little bits of light that are out there that are as possible. So lots of nocturnal animals like our bush baby have really, really big eyeballs. What do you do with feet like these? Hmm. Do any of these feet look like your feet? I think the one in the middle kind of looks like our feet. Hmm. There it is. If you're a chimpanzee, you feed yourself with your feet. We are very closely related to chimpanzees, so their feet look a lot like our feet. They've got the five toes on them, but they can do much more with their feet. They can grab a lot better than we can. So do not use your feet to eat your dinner. Again, your grown-up will be pretty bad. If you're a blue-footed booby, which is this guy right here, you do a dance. They have these beautiful, bright, blue feet. And the boy blue-footed boobies use those feet to show off for the girls. And they're so cool. They do these awesome dances. If you're a water strider, you walk on water. They have these tiny little extensions on the end of the feet that you can't see just by looking at them. And it allows them to sit on top of the water using the surface tension there to walk around instead of sinking underneath. If you're a gecko, this guy right here, you use your sticky feet to walk on the ceiling. How cool would that be? It would be so cool to be able to walk up walls and to hang on the ceiling. Now they're able to do that because if you were to look really, really, really close at their feet, like with a microscope, you would see that they have all these ridges and on those ridges there are little hairs. And all of those tiny little hairs are allow them, are what allows them to cling to sort of any surface. They use sort of um, the, um, the, the static or the electricity between all of those little hairs to help them to climb. Pretty neat stuff. If you're a mountain goat, you leap from ledge to ledge. So cool. They're awesome, awesome at climbing. So they can leap and they use their, um, their, their hooves to sort of balance themselves there. And what do you do with a mouth like this? These mouths are all very, very different. Do you know what animals these belong to? Let's find out. If you're a pelican, you use your mouth as a net to scoop up fish. Awesome. It's like they don't even need a fishing rod to find those fish. They just scoop them up. So if you've ever been in a bath and you're scooping up your toys, that's what a pelican does when it's scooping up its food. If you're a mosquito, you use your mouth to suck blood. That's right. They need, that, they need to eat that blood. Have you ever been bitten by a mosquito? Yes, yeah, sometimes it can make you itchy, right? If you're an egg-eating snake, you use your mouth to swallow eggs larger than your head. That would be like you eating a whole loaf of bread, okay? Just opening your mouth and putting a whole loaf of bread in there. Pretty crazy. Everyone feel sort of back here on your, your uh, jaw. Snakes have an extra bone back there, and that lets them open up their mouth really, really wide. And then snakes also don't have a hard chin. So everyone hit your chin like this. Your chin goes, your bone, the, the bone in your chin goes all the way across. If you were a snake, you'd have a sort of a split right there in your skull. And that would allow your lower jaw to sort of open wide. So you could open this way really wide and you can open this way really wide and that's what lets them eat things that are much bigger than their head like this egg if you're an anteater you capture termites with your long tongue so cool it's awesome if you get a chance try to find a video of an anteater eating it's very neat and if you are oops hold on one second if you are an archer fish you catch insects by shooting them down with a stream of water so this fish will come to the surface and will shoot water and knock the bugs down into the water where they can eat them. Awesome stuff. And then here we are. Very cool facts about all of our animals. Did you like that book? Which was your favorite animal to learn about? I think mine was the four-eyed fish because I didn't know a lot about that animal before I read the story. 
pretty neat. So we learned about lots of different animals who use lots of different parts of their body to help them to survive, to find food or stay safe or to get around. Now I wanted you to see some animals today using their adaptation, so I got sneaky. I set up a camera in my backyard on a couple of my bird feeders. So we're going to watch different animals use their adaptations to eat at my backyard bird feeders. Are you ready? Great. So here's my backyard. Welcome. <laughs> You'll notice that there are three bird feeders right in the middle. You'll also notice sort of that green square at the top. That's okay. Those are going to come and go. That's just the way my camera works. They'll just, as things are moving around, you'll see green squares sometimes. But what I really want you to look at is that red bird right in the center. Do you know what kind of bird that is? It's a bird called a cardinal. Now there's another bird off to the right there that's called a chickadee, but we're gonna talk more about chickadees in a little bit. So let's watch my cardinal and it's going to pull seeds from the bird feeder. What part of its body do you think it's going to use? Well, let's find out. Okay, let's watch him. Oh, he's eating. Oh, he's pulling out more seeds. And then he flew away. All right, lots of stuff was happening in that video. I know it doesn't seem like much, but what I want you to do, we're gonna watch it one more time. I want you to look closely at his beak. He's got a very, very special beak. Now his beak is sort of short and sort of uh, strong. And what he can do is he can crack seeds with his beak. His beak is perfect for cracking seeds, but then he does something else. He'll actually use his tongue and his beak to pull off the shell of each seed that he eats. If you look really closely while he's eating, you can actually see the little bits of shell falling to the ground. He can do all of that with just his beak and his tongue. He doesn't even have to use his feet. Pretty neat stuff. So let's watch that again, and then we'll talk a little bit about how birds fly, okay? So let's watch one more time our cardinal eating the seeds. So let's go back to the beginning, and here we go. See him moving his beak side to side? Because he's breaking those seeds, and he's dropping the parts he doesn't want to eat right out of the bird feeder. And off he flies. Pretty neat stuff, right? So birds have different beaks to help them eat different types of food. Our cardinal has a good seed cracking beak. But lots of birds also use flying to help them find their food. Flying is so cool. Can we fly without a plane? No. Birds' bodies are filled with adaptations to help them to fly, from their feathers to their very light bones to the way that their muscles attach to those bones. They've got so many neat adaptations to help them to fly. Now, would you like to see another one of my flying critters visiting our um, bird feeder? All right, let's check out the next one. Okay, here we are back in my backyard, and we're going to watch a little bird called a chickadee move around these bird feeders, and I want you to watch his head as he moves around. Okay, so there he is. He landed. He's sort of moving his head. He even tur turns it upside down. He's looking around all over, and he can turn his head really, really far. Now, lots of birds can do that, and it's a really neat adaptation. So I want to do something. I want you to look all the way to one side, and all the way to the other, and all the way up, and all the way down. Now, if you don't move your shoulders, you can't really look around that far, but if you were a bird, you'd be able to look behind you more easily and even sort of turn your head upside down. And that's really good because we can do something the birds can't do. Now, I want you to hold your face. Don't move your face, okay? Now, I want you to look up, but don't move your face. And look down, and up, and down, and up, and down. What part of your body did you move? Yeah, you moved your eyeballs around. Now birds, like our chickadee, can't really move their eyeballs around. They've got little bony um, uh, circles around their eyes that stop them from moving them as, as easily as we can. So instead, they turn their head really far to see around them to make sure there's no predators coming and to make sure, in this case, that no birds are coming to eat their bird seed because that's about to happen in our video. So let's go back to that. We'll see our chickadee and we'll watch its head move around again. And then we'll see a second bird come to our bird feeder. Okay, so there's our chickadee. You can see him turning his head all over, looking around, making sure nobody's coming, turning it upside down, looking around the bird feeder. Now watch the tree to the left there. You're gonna see another bird coming right 
there he is right there. And look at the way he's sitting on that bird feeder. Is it the same or different as our cardinal and our chickadee? It's totally different. He's hanging upside down. Do you know what kind of bird that is? <laughs> it's a woodpecker. Now, woodpeckers, when they need to find their food, they spend most of their time looking for their food on uh, the bark of trees. So they're sort of hanging and they peck to find things like bugs. Now, when they're, they also eat things like seeds at my bird feeder, so that when he jumped over to the bird feeder and was sort of hanging upside down, it didn't bother him at all because he's used to sort of hanging weirdly when he's got to um, find his food from the bark of a tree. So it doesn't bother him at all. Now, the birds are really cool, but I gotta say, the furry friends, the mammals who visited my bird feeder were awesome. So let's see another video with two of my furry friends visiting my bird feeder and talk about the different ways that their body helps them to get seeds from the bird feeder. Okay, here we are back in the backyard. Now, don't blink because our first furry friend is going to be joining the bird feeder just from the left over there from the tree. All right, so watch the tree. Let's watch him. There he comes. You blink and you missed it. What animal just jumped onto the bird feeders? It's a little chipmunk. Can you see the bird feeders sort of spinning with him on it? Whoa. Because he jumped at that bird feeder because he can't fly there and land softly like our birds can because he doesn't have those adaptations. Instead, he climbed up the tree and jumped to it. Now, we're used to seeing chipmunks crawling around on the ground, but they are actually fairly good climbers, just not as good as maybe a squirrel would be, okay? Because they don't have the big sloppy tail or the strong legs to help them to, to, to climb quite as high as squirrels do. And speaking of squirrels, look who just joined. We have a squirrel and he's climbing down. What parts of his body is he using? Yeah, he's using his puffs. Uh-oh. <laughs> what just happened? Our squirrel tried to jump from the top of the um, uh, shepherd's hook to the bird feeder and he fell. Hmm. Now, don't feel too bad for him, okay? Because I'm going to show you another video, and we're going to look at all of the really cool adaptations that squirrels have to make the most of my bird feeder. Are you ready? All right, here we go. All right, let's watch a more successful attempt by our squirrels to get some seeds. So now you can see the squirrel is, whoa, he's hanging on to the bird feeder. He's already made it on. He's made the jump over to that bird feeder. Now, watch as he climbs up. Watch him use his tail to balance himself. Now, we don't do that. We don't have tails. But if you were to walk in a balance beam or you were to climb somewhere and you didn't want to fall off of it, you'd put your arms out to the side so that you could balance this way. But if we're watching our birds and our squirrel, you can see, look, he's using his tail. He's kind of flipping it around. That's helping him to jump and to stay balanced. That's one of the best ways that squirrels can sort of jump around treetops and not fall. They have awesome balance because of those super cool squirrel tails. And that's not the only way squirrels can sort of pull food from our bird feeder using different parts of their body. Let's watch another time when the squirrel was able to use its ability to climb to get all the bird seeds. So let's watch our squirrel now. He's climbing down the tree and instead of jumping on, oops, you know, called the chipmunk, instead of jumping onto the bird feeder, what is he doing? Yeah, he's stretching. Now, that's something he can do that the chipmunk can't do. The chipmunk can't stretch all the way across there because they're much smaller. But watch, as he pulls himself across, he holds onto the tree with what part of his body? Yeah, he's got those little nails, and those nails help him to hang on. Look, he's only hanging out with one foot there. Now, watch as he grabs the food. What part of his body is he using to put the seeds in his mouth? is using his paws. So he's using the paws to hold on and the paws to put the food in. Look, he's only hanging on by one foot again. That's pretty impressive. Now watch, he's actually hanging upside down and eating that food, sort of like the woodpecker did. Now they both use their feet to hang on the tree, but they use it a little bit differently, huh? Pretty cool stuff. 
so neat that we can learn about animal adaptations just by watching the critters that visit our backyard. Now, if you're lucky enough to have pets at home, you can watch your pets, see what parts of their body they use to find their food and to stay safe and to get around. You can go for a walk in your neighborhood with your grown-ups and look for bugs and birds and see what parts of their bodies they're using to get around. Watching animals is the best way to learn about them. So we're gonna do one more activity before I let you go today. So grownups, go ahead and gather these supplies. No stress if you don't have them right now. I'm gonna show you a little bit of the supplies that you can use for this game, but if you wanna do it later, if you wanna pause the video or use the video that's um, gonna be provided to you at the end of the webinar, that's fine too. No stress, do it whenever you've got the time and the space to do it. So for this game, we're gonna pretend we're birds. Okay, we're all different kinds of birds. Now, how do birds um, get the food that they need to eat? How do they grab it? Usually they grab it with their beak. Now, there are some really cool birds like parrots and crows that will use their feet to bring the food to their mouth. But for the most part, most birds will use their beak to get food. So we saw our cardinal. Our cardinal had that nice, strong beak that it used to crack open the seeds and use its tongue to peel off the parts it didn't want. In our book, we saw the pelican had a big scoop that's its, its beak was good for scooping fish up out of the water. And ducks have nice flat beaks that they use to sort of sift through the um, uh, sand and dirt at the bottom of a pond to get all the things out that they want to eat. So different birds have different types of beaks to eat the, to eat the food that they want to eat. So we're going to see what sort of bird beaks work best for what sort of food. So you're gonna play a game. So you can see here on my camera, I've got all sorts of kitchen utensils. You can use whatever you have available. So I've got some tongs here. I've got a pair of chopsticks. I've got a, a clothespin. Um, I, I've got a, um, a spatula, a fork and a spoon and a big spoon there. So gather enough sort of utensils for everyone in your family or your class to have a different kind of beak. And then what you're going to do is you want to grab some food. Now the food can be whatever you want it to be. In fact, I suggest getting lots of different kinds of food and trying them out. So you can see over here, I've gathered some different types of food. Now to play the game, you'll want to put out one type of food at a time. So for me, I may put out pom-poms first and then all the birds should try to gather up as many pom-poms as they can and then talk about it. Which bird had the easiest time scooping up the pom-poms? Was it the bird that had the um, big spoon beak or was it the bird that had the spatula beak? Or maybe it was the chopstick beak bird. Probably wasn't the chopstick beak bird. But then now try a different food. Maybe try these flowers or beads. And I've got these like little butterfly shaped beads here too. You can use whatever you want as long as you've got sort of enough for everybody to try scooping up or grabbing the food. So like, I included these things too because I think that maybe our chopstick beak would have a really good chance with those. So really have fun, talk about it. Talk about which adaptations, which beaks work best for which kinds of food. And then see if you can think of a bird that has a beak that's sort of like that. Can you think of a bird that does more scooping or pinching? So, so think about real birds and how their beaks are sort of like the beaks you are using for the games. Now, grownups, in the blog post that you're going to get um, at the end of this webinar, there's going to be an extension for some older learners. So uh, we talk a little bit more about natural selection and how bird beaks can uh, teach us a little bit about that. So check out the blog post for some of that information. Now, I want to thank you so much for hanging out today. Obviously, I love chatting about animals. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you drew a lot of pictures of the animals I have in my backyard. I hope you explore your own backyard. And as you're drawing those pictures and taking those notes and learning so much about animals, please share them with us. We would love to see what your family or your classroom is up to. Um, thanks again for hanging out with me. I hope to see you again next week for our final Nature Science with Holly webinar. Um, any questions? Make sure to shoot them our way. Thank you so much and have fun exploring. Thanks, Holly. That was great.
That was great. I think I, I had a big smile on my face the whole time. Um, I brought um, some buttons that I was uh, practicing with. Um, people that I work with know that I, I love buttons. So any chance to dig out my button collection and um, my kitchen tools, um, I had some good fun doing that activity. So just to let, I mean, just a couple, I always like to talk about some of the things that really uh, stuck with me during the presentation. And one of my favorite little descriptions by Holly was um, when she talked about the mold that has um, sticky alley bits. And I'm not sure, Holly, if that's a scientific term. I mean, but obviously <laughs> that is a scientific term, sticky alley bits. We also have them here. We get sticky alley bits here. <laughs> Just, just checking, but that, that was an adorable description and that was such a cool little animal. And I also just love the word that we learned that adaptations and knowing that uh, Holly and I both really also like um, any opportunity to talk about literacy and um, reading. That's a great word with four parts. So say it, stretch it out. I mean, it's a nice big word that children can learn to use and um, now they have a full understanding of the meaning of it. So um, for those of you that haven't been with us before, we do want to let you know that we offer all of the books that Holly's been reading throughout this series. We do think this will make a great unit of study. Somebody said at the beginning in the chat box, <clears throat> excuse me, that they actually are studying nature this week. So these books would be great to have. And um, we are offering free shipping with this promo code to anybody that is in this series. So you should go to shopbecker.com and um, there you'll see the item number and there is your promo code. Uh, we also want to let you know that there are so many other materials that support this theme and if you want to expand upon it, just the whole idea of how animals adapt to their surroundings. So we have the Arctic animals, clearly they have certain adaptations in their color and um, how they deal with the cold weather. And these series are really terrific. We have lots of different sets of these footprint stones. So Holly did talk about how the shape of the foot and the way the foot functions is another adaptation that animals have for their lifestyle. So uh, that might be something neat to bring into your classrooms. And this set is just a really great opportunity for children to really understand about how, animal, how animals interact with their own habitat. So next week is the last week of this series and we surely hope you will come back. We surely hope you will invite friends um, to get that this final taste of what we've been experiencing for the last three weeks. Uh, fossils and dinosaurs is a great topic. There is a list of the materials you will need to do this activity with us next week. So just jot that down if you'd like to. As always, I, I will always send um, reminders of the materials and reminders about the session that's coming next Wednesday at four o'clock Eastern time. And we sure hope you will all join us. And let's just see what's going on in the chat box. Anything that we should address out loud? So please let us know if you have any questions. Holly is standing by. If you weren't here in the beginning, uh, Holly shared two of her furry friends at home, Dottie and Flo. So if you didn't get to see them, maybe you could uh, let Holly know that you'd like another little sneak peek if they are still um, in the mood to be on camera. And other than that, we hope to see you next week. Same time, same place. Dinosaurs and fossils. So, oh. so there was a request. For, Great. Uh, let, me, let me see if we know who it is. Is it Dottie or Flo? Who remembers from last time? I'm going to say it's Dottie. It is. Wow, you're good. <laughs> well, yeah, we bonded. Yes, you did. We bonded. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. You virtually bonded. <laughs> yeah, we virtually bonded for sure. Oh, someone asked if you could make me a little bit bigger so they can see the rat again. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. For sure, for sure. And I, and I could get off of here. You don't need to see me. And I'm going to mute myself so that we'll just see you.
Hey everyone, so thank you so much for talking about animals with me today. I love animals. I have quite a menagerie at my house, including my rats, Dottie and Flo, who are hanging out with me today during the presentation, getting tangled up on my microphone. <laughs> now rats are rodents just like the squirrels and the chipmunks in our video. So they have a lot of the same adaptations, including that really long tail that helps them. There it is, the really long tail. It helps them to balance, you can see it there. There's her really long tail. That's Dottie's very long tail right there. They're excellent climbers. There she is. <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging out. If you've got any other questions, shoot them in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, and of course, check out the blog post for um, sort of step-by-step -step directions on how to play the bird beat game with your family or your classroom. Great, and um, if somebody wants to put in the chat yet again, if anybody that maybe signed in a little late, uh, what the link is to access the recording and the blog and the, all the details about the activity and extra resources. We always, Holly always includes some great additional resources to learn more, and as she said, um, for older learner, learners as well. And I hope that means um, me too as a senior citizen. I hope that <laughs> there's something in there for me. Um, and um, oh, what else? Oh, no, there was a question, um, Holly, I'm not sure if you saw it, uh, that Rob retyped for us about um, chameleons and- Oh, yeah, so I answered it in the uh, question oh, and answer thing, but I can answer it now. Someone okay. has a question about chameleons camouflaging. So this is tricky. Now in cartoons and TV we, and, and movies, we always see chameleons um, camouflaging. They'll change color and they'll blend in with whatever they're doing. But really, most chameleons will change color really for communication. So the, to let other chameleons and other animals sort of know how they're feeling, that's when they're changing color. So uh, camouflage would be awesome if they could blend in with everything like we see on, don't chew on my microphone, there we go. Uh, so everything we could um, uh, see on TV and, and movies was real, but unfortunately not. They could only really use it to communicate with each other. That was a really good question. Very, very cool. Somebody did ask if uh, we could see them or they only could see us. And yeah, the way these webinars work is that when you sign on, you are automatically muted just so that we can manage. Everybody has, is going to be having different background noise. And so everybody's automatically muted and their uh, cameras are also off. So you only see us, um, the two of us. And uh oh, I lost my virtual. Pack. Oh no, we've seen behind the curtain. Oh, wait, 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 no, wait a <laughs> Come back. Um, so <laughs> there I am. My heavens. So, yes, so we are both here. And uh, oh, thank everybody's uh, en enjoyed this week yet again, Holly. I'm seeing all these great comments. So, we, we have so much fun spending this time with you. And really we love. <laughs> I love that we love the chatting and we're going to be all sad next week when we have to say goodbye to everybody but um do come back uh thank you for hanging out with us pre-dinner after a long day and uh the way the way holly does these i hope that everybody's kind of getting the the um the idea that this is now a way for you to communicate this information to your young children uh, a lot of enthusiasm a lot of um, background knowledge just so that you can be available to answer questions when children have them. And children will be filled with wonder and questions about anything nature related. Um, and so Amy wants to know if you have plans to offer more in the future. Um, well, we hope we hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, see her, you see her cleaning herself? Sorry, that, I, was, I was only half listening, but she was cleaning herself and I was showing it off. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's quite all right. We were, someone was asking if we were going to have an encore Ooh. performance after, after this series <laughs> is over. Um, so please let us know, communicate with us if that's something you would be interested in, especially if after the summer you're back in your classrooms. How do you think this would work for you? Would this still be a good time? I mean, we would love to be able to, to bring Holly back to you again because um, I know I personally have enjoyed it very much and learned a tremendous amount. I've had a blast. This has been so much fun. Great, great, great. So Ooh, we how to make compost. We talked a little bit about making compost um, with the worms. So the first... Um, uh, webinar for nature science. We used, we talked about worms, we talked a little bit about compost, and the blog post for that one has um, some great 
resources for the classroom and for home on how to do composting with kiddos. That, that's a great idea. Great. So I'm going to take my mic off. Um, we will let everybody finish up their chatting and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dottie. <laughs>